Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. If you are joining us from the West Coast, we are trying to figure out our video issues so that we can get on camera. Um, but in the meantime, it's three after the hour, so I want to get started. Um, thank you so much for everybody who is on this webinar today. We are hosting it because we know there are a lot of questions, there's confusion, and certainly interest in next steps with the experimental ALS therapy neuron. Um, it's been a long journey and a very hard one for the ALS community. So we believe it's really important for everyone here to get the answers that they deserve. Um, I want to thank our colleagues at Brainstorm Therapeutics for joining today and answering our questions. Um, and we'll turn it over to them in a minute. For those who don't know me, I'm the C CEO of IMALS, and I want to also introduce my co-moderator, Dan Tate. Um, I believe he needs no introduction, but he is an incredible IMALS board member and has been with the organization since its inception in 2019. Um, Dan is also the founder of Forbes Tate Partners, a prominent government and public affairs consulting firm based in D.C., he also has been engaged in neuron work and FDA advocacy for years, having had a meeting with the FDA and Brian Wallach on neuron in 2019, I believe, um, and delivering IMALS's community petition in person to Dr. Marks last year. So thank you, Dan, for being here and moderating with me. Um, today, we'll have a series of questions that we're first going to ask Brainstorm. These are the questions that were based on what you all submitted um, during your um, webinar registration. We've ties the questions and themes that came up multiple times. Um, and then when we are done with those questions that we have already planned from all of you, we'll use any remaining time we have for live questions from the chat if your question, of course, has not already been answered. Um, so now I'm gonna hand it over to the brainstorm team to introduce themselves. Yeah, thank you so much um, for inviting us today to this town hall meeting. We're, we're very grateful to have this opportunity to be with the community. I'm Mary Kay Turner, Senior Vice President of Advocacy and Government Affairs. Today, I'm joined by my colleagues, President and CEO, Heim Lebowitz, Co-CEO, Dr. Stacey Lindbergh, and Senior Manager of Patient Advocacy, Kylan Morris. I will begin by thanking all of the clinical trial participants and their loved ones for their selfless dedication, for being part of our trials and for moving science forward. We also want to express our gratitude to the entire ALS community for your unwavering support through this process. We look forward to a thoughtful conversation and we hope it will provide some clarity and answers. We understand and we acknowledge that the withdrawal of the BLA and the requirement for another phase three trial has caused great pain in the community. And we hope this discussion will provide rationale for our decision-making process to withdraw the BLA. I personally have spent decades working in the pharmaceutical industry across many diseases. ALS is by far the most difficult and the most cruel. And that's why I and the brainstorm team are continuing to work in ALS. The logical conclusion for us as a company after unblinding the phase trial, phase three in 2020, was to discontinue our ALS program. But due to our CEO, Heim's perseverance and determination and support from Dr. Lindbergh, along with the ALS community and key thought leaders, we continued to look at the data and gain insights. And it became apparent to us that neuron produced a clinically meaningful effect in those patients that could be measured. So we made a very unconventional decision and a tough decision to move forward on a path that not many would take. We decided to file the BLA. As you know, the FDA chose to the FDA chose to um, reject our filing. We filed over protest and we pushed for an ad con because we believe the community could not afford to lose a therapy that helps some people with ALS. 
We believe the ADCOM was the venue for a fair and transparent scientific discussion about a complex data set in a very heterogeneous disease. We share the community's disappointment about the process and the ADCOM and the outcome. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Stacy Lindbergh to walk you through this process in more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Kay. And I want to thank everybody that has joined us for this town hall and IMLS for suggesting this discussion. It's a very important discussion and a very important interaction for us to have. So we have some simple goals. Number one, we want to answer your questions and we want to give insight into the path forward and what we're doing now. Before I dive in and offer some, some starting remarks, I think it's best to start and offer a few reflections. Um, and this context that I'll provide is really an evaluation of our historical decisions, which Mary Kay just walked you through. We haven't had any illusions about our data. It looks like we can now come on screen. So good to see you all. Um, so we haven't had any um, illusions about our, our, our data. Um, but as I, I stand here today and we think back about the decisions we made, um, we still believe that they are appropriate and that our phase three data was approvable. We offered scientific insights into why our trial goals were not met. We provided an understanding of why a meaningful difference, both clinically and statistically, was observed in the trial across participants with less advanced disease, including why these results were different from those with advanced ALS. We engaged some of the best experts in the world across areas of expertise, medical, statistical, and legal. And we listened to their objective counsel and input. We gave them access to our, our data to formulate independent beliefs and brought them to the ADCOM to represent their independent views. We took big risks, as Mary Kay just appropriately described as unconventional decisions. And why did we do this? First, we believed in our data, and we still do. Number two, the landscape was changing, and there was precedent of approvals where there was regulatory uncertainty, including all endpoints missed. And third, we knew that, that starting a trial would mean longer delays for everyone living with ALS. Therefore, we believed these risks were appropriate and prudent and worthy of our goal to seek approval for neuron based on this data. We prepared well for this outcome. In fact, we conducted multiple formal mock adcoms in advance of the meeting with highly skilled excerpts matched well to the standing members of the adcom. So in short, we really couldn't have taken this more seriously nor prepared better by seeking objective feedback, which helped us refine our materials. We believe that the ADCOM would be the forum to explore the real issues, which really are the clinical outcomes. And it didn't turn out to be the case. Declaring that this trial did not meet evidentiary standards was well within the FDA's remit. But to declare otherwise required engagement into why there were differences in conclusions. What the meeting lacked was time and engagement into why there were differences. Given this ADCOM and review team, the only thing we believe we could change that could have changed the outcome would have been if we had another trial. This takes us to our decision to withdraw, and we firmly believe this is the only path forward. We never would have withdrawn the BLA if we weren't convinced that we would not be successful with this data alone. Therefore, it's in our best interest to move quickly and as quickly as we can in getting a trial started. So I'll offer in my last um, comments just a little bit about our path forward. And first, it's important for you to know that as a company, we're putting everything behind the approval of Neuro. The phase three B trial will be robust and we're seeking formal FDA alignment, hoping to have a SPA. We waited and requested, um, will request a meeting with the FDA after this town hall so that we can incorporate our feedback from you but we will move immediately afterwards to request um, a time with them. In advance of the ADCOM, um, we worked with scientific advisors and also members of the ALIS community to help design a trial. 
which is of course speeding up our efforts now. All participants that will be enrolled in the trial will receive standard of care. And as this is our last shot on goal, the decisions that we make will be guided by this, as well as the views of the ALS community. So what all this means is that we've had to put the ADCOM and our journey to the state behind us because we believe that any further work on this would be futile. We need to move forward with the hope of bringing forward a therapy in the shortest time frame possible. With this, we'll turn it over for question and answer. Thanks so much, Stacey. And I know we want to spend most of our time today on questions relating to our path forward, um, but there we know that there's a lot of remaining questions and confusion around some of the key topics that came up at the ADCOM, including manufacturing and safety and things. So just kind of an open question. Is there anything in particular you want to clarify about those ADCOM questions before we uh, move forward with our next questions? Yeah, thank you for that, um, Andrea. And it was helpful to actually read the questions that emerged um, and um, that were on the minds of the community from, from the outcome in advance of, of us discussing this, um, this town hall. And I think there are three topics that I wanna offer a little bit of perspective on. Um, the first, there was a question about um, should post hoc analyses be used to prove efficacy and really the role of post hoc analyses and you know, from my perspective, what's important with unplanned analyses is why you're running them, the rigor you bring to them, and um, how likely the conclusions are that they're spurious or by chance. I was thinking back to the uh, Traversa and Atcom, and um, if you followed it closely, you may remember there was a statement made by an Atcom member to the effect of, I'm less concerned with what is pre-specified versus post-hoc, and more interested in what is more accurate. And I have to say, as a scientist, I really agree with this. Um, from our phase three trial, given the floor effect observed, post hoc analyses were the most accurate way to portray the evidence in the trial. Um, and in fact, Dr. Wei from, uh, from Harvard School of Public Health did an analysis that alleviated the concerns of that these conclusions really could just be spurious. Um, his analyses showed strong statistical evidence that, the, that given the consistency of effect across endpoints and time points and biomarkers, that this is only likely to occur in the presence of a treatment effect. And he, he presented that very nicely. Um, therefore, in my view, and also in the view of multiple external experts, both statisticians and neurologists, the post hoc analyses combined with the pre-specified endpoints were not only the most appropriate, they actually were necessary. Um, the next topic is touching on manufacturing and quality and consistency from our, um, from our trial. And um, there were questions about, um, was there consistency across the products or how do you ensure there's consistency? And, you know, when you think about quality um, and, and drug development, so sponsors work extremely closely with FDA through the development of a product like Neuron. And you can imagine in order to treat people with an investigational product, there's a lot of scrutiny about um, manufacturing of a product to ensure it's safe and effective per the specifications. We had quality control specifications throughout the manufacturing process, and we had detailed release criteria, which were agreed by the FDA to ensure that each product manufactured had expected potency and quality to safely be safely administered. And we had close to 500 neuron products that were produced, all of which, all 500 met the release criteria, which means that every pod product that was um, administered met the specifications ensuring potency and safety of the product as agreed to by the FDA. What's important to know is that when a product moves from R&D to commercial, um, there are additional tests and qualifications that are required, which is the case um, with the manufacturing items raised by FDA during our review. So this doesn't mean that there was anything lacking in the clinical setting for our trials or a quality concern from the trials conducted, just additional work required to be commercialized, all of which can be solved, um, and they're just a matter of doing the work, which is what we were doing. 
the last set of questions that were in uh, the, the feedback passed um, in advance was really around preclinical data, target engagement, and mechanism of action. Um, if you've ever seen anyone summarize um, drug development, um, you'll often see a rocket ship used as an explanation. Um, and typically, if you have a rocket, the blaster is, is represented by preclinical work, and the tip of the rocket is phase three. And, and the reason for that is when we start R&D, we typically start in animals, often mice, and we learn through preclinical experiments in order to ensure that the product is safe for humans. FDA and other regulators um, have to approve a company to move into um, the first human trials, um, and preclinical experiments are a prerequisite. So, of course, Brainstorm did multiple preclinical experiments, um, and we were approved by FDA to move into human studies. Um, in fact, there are approvals all along the development path, including proceeding into phase two and ultimately phase three. And of course, if the FDA is ever concerned about an investigational product, um, you can be put on clinical hold. You can see this in the public domain with other products. And of course, all trial work has to stop, which, it, which never happened with, with Neuron. So at a preclinical stage, what we're often most interested in are things like mechanism of action of a drug, because it helps you understand how the product will work and decide what to measure, what risks might exist, and um, anything you need to monitor um, carefully. So, you know, for many drugs that are approved, mechanism of action is very valuable. Um, what's interesting is that there actually are a lot of approved products that we don't know the mechanism of action for, including the first product I ever worked on in my career is an innovative drug for schizophrenia, which has been used by more than 20 million patients. And to this day, we still don't know the mechanism of action. So once you have clinical data, especially phase three clinical trial data that's large in size, this really, you've gone beyond like a rocket that takes off and it, it, the, the booster falls to the wayside. It trumps mechanism of action and preclinical questions. And while these are scientifically still very interesting, basic science really should be very separate from the clinical evaluation of the product. Those are all the topics. Thank you. Um, Helen, maybe you are good to answer this question. There have been a lot of um, concern over unwinding, and um, I think um, it would be helpful for, or for all of us if you could update us on the status of unwinding for patients and loved ones. I'd be happy to, Dan. Um, I do feel that I have somewhat of a unique perspective in this department as I am working on the patient advocacy team for Brainstorm and also had a family member as a phase three trial participant. So to begin, we would like to thank every single phase three participant and their loved one. We initially committed to unblinding the data once the regulatory process had been completed and it ultimately took longer than had been anticipated. Now that the regulatory process is complete, we are working with the principal investigators at each of the inv individual clinical trial sites to work through the technical issues of the unblinding process, which includes IRB approval. And so we are expecting that to be complete soon. And in the meantime, the treatment codes will be sent to the PIs and they will th then directly reach out to the trial participants or their loved one. And that confidential information exchange is confidential because it is it pertains to private medical information. Thank you. So uh, if I understand this, it will be from the doctors to the family members. Is that right? Correct. It will be it will be through the principal investigators to the trial participants directly. Yeah, I think that's helpful to understand. Thanks, Kylan, because I do think there's an expectation that at some point the trial participants will just be known and know their their group status. 
Um, but if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying that, that they will learn it from their uh, principal investigator at their site or their treating clinician. And then obviously we'll have the agency to share with folks if they're interested in doing so. Correct. Right. And I would just add to that, Andrea, that they're free to share. Brainstorm remains blinded. Um, patients are de-identified in numbers to brainstorm. And so it's only the clinical trial site and the participant or the loved one who knows that. And they're free to share if, if they chose. Thank you. I'm looking at my questions. Give me one second. Um, Mary Kay, um, can you share your thoughts on conditional approval pathway as proposed in the Promising Pathway Act and whether that could be helpful to Neuron in the future? Sure. So first of all, um, I, I, I love the work and the energy. And I was so excited to watch the hearing in the ALS community on the Promising Pathways. So bravo to all of you. Um, I, I think the Promising Pathways is important, um, especially because we have such different definitions of regulatory flexibility within the agency and within divisions. However, for us at Brainstorm, I, it's going to come too late. It's very clear for us that our path forward is another 3B trial. And, you know, we understand that the current developmental, you know, system for, for 10 to 15 years does not match a progressive disease like ALS. And so we'll cheer you on and, and hope that that can come to fruition. But for us, we need to do the trial and get the additional data to be able to resubmit the BLA. Thank you. Um, the soon is perhaps best answered by hand. Um, and uh, so, what is the status of fundraising for the free thing from? And then, um, you think you can find the ones and, um, uh, personal. Question is why not just throw up your hands and sell these drugs to another company? Um, thank you, um, Dante, for the wonderful question. Uh, please allow me first also to join my colleagues in thanking IMALS for moderating this call. It's very important, as Andrea, you said in the opening. And then thank you for being a joint moderator together with Andrea. Uh, your selflessness, like many ALS patients we see in the last few years, is just very inspiring. I also wanted to acknowledge um, the advocacy brainstorm team, uh, Mary Kay Turner and Kyla Morris, who work tirelessly with you every day. Thank you to my colleague, co-CEO, Dr. Stacey Lindbergh, to her devotion and un unwavering commitment to bring Neuron forward and for dealing the outcome for us, leading the outcome for us. I'd like to stay, take a step back prior to responding to the funding of a phase 3B trial, if it's okay. Um, it's never been an easy process to fund and develop a therapy. It's especially difficult in ALS and even more so with a cellular therapy. We've always had to work very hard from the beginning to raise the funds for the clinical development of neuro. CIRM, which is the California Institution for Regenerative Medicine, granted us about $20 million for the phase B trial. And that was about 50% of that trial, which allowed us to move forward. When we unblinded the trial in 2020, the most straightforward decision was to discontinue the development of neuron for ALS. However, in working with our principal investigators and world-class statisticians, Dr. Sberry, Dr. Wade, as Stacey mentioned, we believed and still do that neuron produced a clinically meaningful effect. But as you know, the FDA did not share this view of the data. Still, Having all living ALS patients in mind, we moved forward and filed the BLA. And even after a surprising refusal to file letter, 
went forward with the most difficult path of filing over protest and requesting an outcome, where we hoped and wanted to believe the process would be fair and transparent. Unfortunately, in our view, not that not that's what has transpired. I, I want to thank those who present and gave sound science support for the outcome, starting with Dr. Lindbergh, Dr. Tony Windebank, Dr. Nathan Staff, Dr. Bob Bowser, Dr. LJ Way, and Dr. Don Berry. All are world-class scientists, statisticians, and physicians in the field of ALS, and share our view that neuron is a clinically meaningful therapy. So many have asked us to, to protest the outcome and process of the outcome. However, it's clear, like my colleagues just said, that the only path forward towards a possible approval is to produce more data with a successful phase 3B trial. So go back to your question, we are working on fund funding, but there is no guarantee that we will secure it. Since the beginning of when I joined Brainstorm, I've led the fundraising efforts, including my own $5 million investment, and have been successful over the years to raise the funds needed. I hope this too will be successful. This is a challenging time in the capital markets to raise any funds, especially after the results of an FDA outcome 17-1, we're approaching many allies, including CIRM and other pharma. I will share with you that the FDA is expressing that they want us to move forward with another trial. We'll see if we are able to align with them on the trial design. If this happens in a timely manner, I believe that we will have an easier time raising the funds. So to sum this up, we're doing all we can to fund the trial and move forward. I know many of you are not happy with the timing. Believe me, I am not. I think our actions speak to that, what we did over the last few years. We were trying to bring the treatment as fast as possible. That's why we chose filing over the test rather than resubmitting, not to waste another year with that. ALS waits for no one. We know that. Unfortunately, at this time, there is no other alternative. We exhausted all other pathways. So the only regulatory path forward is a phase 3B trial. Funding is going to be tough. I want to thank our team that are willing to take this effort with us to, to go through a very tough financial time and try to make it happen. So thank you for that. Thank you, Chaim. I know that's um, it's hard for people to hear, but thank you for sharing. Um, we've also heard, and you know, starting with the day of the adcom and thereafter, and and a lot of questions um, that came in for this webinar around the disappointment of lack of real world data that was expected to be part of the FDA application. So I want to share that I've noticed that disappointment. And there's a question from the community broadly about what needs to happen to enable real world data collection and visibility for the next application. And I think in particular, this community is interested in what we can do. Is there legislation, some sort of FDA action? What can um, we make happen to enable that moving forward? Yeah, Andrea, I can um, take the first step at this question, I think it's an important one. And, you know, we have to ultimately step back and think about our position as the sponsor. And, you know, we're accountable for bringing forward data and evidence that's across trial participants. And, you know, the goal with that is so that you can um, demonstrate a treatment effect relative to your control. Um, we can collect data in trials, for exa example, there are patient reported outcomes or other measures of daily living. Um, but for this to really be part of our application that's going into a BLA, it needs to be data that's coming from all trial participants. And, you know, and again, that's that's really from a holistic goal to, to draw, um, a, you know, tr kind of truth about treatment from a, from a trial. And, um, you know, while while critical in, in nature, individual data, it's extremely important and valuable 
Um, it can lead to new hypotheses that can be confirmed in future trials, and it's obviously extremely important um, to provide perspective on what individuals experienced. And the, the testimonies and the open public hearing portion of the ADCOM offered really complementary, and again, I, I'd say a, a more holistic view of the experience of those that were um, receiving neurons. So we're, we're grateful for the stance that the willingness to share their personal data and to do so in such a rigorous way. And in terms of the part of your question, which is really what can we do to have this be more included in the future, um, we will absolutely be adding additional measures to our phase 3B trial um, and really trying to make sure we can talk about, um, you know, that represents broader perspective of daily living and important, um, you know, out, outcomes for, for people. Um, when you are having these three results, why not just turn the three study after that, after the his three trial, why not just have certain the three B immediately after that? And I think that may be best for CC or me even Mary Kay. Mary do you want to start? Yeah, I'm mute, Mary. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the question. Dan's question is, why wasn't the 3B trial started immediately after um, the phase three trial? Yeah, so uh, I think we, I, I think hindsight is always 2020, right? And um, as Stacy said in the beginning, we saw the regulatory flexibility evolving. We, it took, we have a very complex data set, um, biomarkers um, across three pathways, um, no one had seen the, uh, you know, 23% of the people in a study have a floor effect. So it took us a while to, number one, understand the study. And when we understood the data, we became more confident in the, in the patients that you could measure that there was a treatment effect. And so we decided to go for it. We also, at the time, didn't have funding. As Heim said, it's not easy to get funding. In many ways, we're breaking through many new pathways and doors. This is a cellular therapy for ALS. The, the FDA hasn't approved a cellular therapy in, for ALS. And so we made the decision at the time to go forward with the BLA. Um, again, hindsight's 2020, and we trusted the process. We brought forward the best data we had. And if it would have been successful, we would have been delivering our own you know, in the near future to people. And so, um, you know, if we knew them what we knew now, it might be different, but we, we use the best decision-making process that we had at the time. Thank you for the question. Just to add to that, we did not have the funding, just like we don't have now, mm -hmm. do a full phase 3B trial. So it made a lot of sense to go through an outcome. We've seen the flexibility of ALS guidelines. And again, when we look back, we still think this should have been approved by the FDA based on the data we had. So again, we didn't hit statistical significance. Everyone knows the problems with our data, but we thought that once diving in, just like all the experts, and you all could listen, and it's on, it's on YouTube. You can listen to the presentation we did. And I think it's very convincing. We just didn't have that comprehensive discussion we were hoping to have in the afternoon. We're not allowed to, but going through that pathway and arguing won't bring an approval. So we're getting over our emotions and trying to see if we can find funding, which is a question, funding, and, and try to do another trial. It's it's not it's not automatic. <laughs> There's no guarantee, as I said. But thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So clearly this leaves our community wondering how can we po is there a possibility to get neuron into bodies now or in the near future? What does that pipeline look like? So does brainstorm plan to offer an EAP? You know, what is the opportunity to get neuron to patients? So we certainly understand the urgency 
to want access to the investigational therapy, especially neuron. And we want to be able to support an EAP, but a number of things have to happen. Number one, we have to have the resources to be able to do it. And that's financial resources. We have to get the trial funded first, because as you know, um, one of the regulations in expanded access is it cannot interfere with your clinical development process. So we have to get additional resources. We do know that ACT for ALS monies are out there, so we can consider them. In addition, it's a capacity level, and that's just not financial. We have a small staff, as you know, we let go a number of our staff, so we're even smaller now. And there's manufacturing capability. So this is not a small molecule. This is not a biologic. This isn't even an allergenic off the shelf therapy. This is a therapy that is made for each person. And we, we have the ability to scale up, but you don't scale up until you have an approved product. So more than likely for um, the phase 3B, this will still be a manual process. We're working on an automated process, which will make it faster. And then the last thing is we have to ensure that it doesn't interfere with the phase three, because the only way to give broad access to an autologous cellular therapy is through an approval. So we have to get the phase three B up and running, but we won't discount a, an EAP, but all those three criteria have to be met. And so it, it's, it's not like a small molecule where we could just make additional tablets and send them to people. It's a very different situation. Thanks, Mary Kay. So um, knowing we have about 20 minutes left, let's get into the trial design and your planning. There are a ton of um, questions about, you know, timeline, potential sites, eligibility criteria, number of participants you're looking at. Um, so I'll leave that as an open question for now, if you can share where you are in planning and what the proposed design looked like, and then I might have a few follow-ups. Okay. I'll take that. So, um, you know, it, it is a bit early to get into a lot of details because our trial design isn't final. Um, and in fact, our next step, as I, I referenced earlier in our call, is to get input and align with FDA on the trial design and the goals. Um, like in terms of some of the perspective um, that I can offer, um, you know, the neuron will continue to be administered intrathecally. Um, as we've studied across all four of our clinical trials, it's the best way to administer the treatment for um, circulation to be delivered um, into the brain. Um, the trial will allow for standard of care for all trial participants. These are approved, all approved products. Um, and, you know, of course, we are harnessing the learning. Mirke spoke about, you know, we have learned so much about um, the ALIS of our scale, the um, in inclusion criteria, and really ultimately um, trial participants that we're going to be able to, um, to uh, deliver and measure the treatment effect. Um, we'll be harnessing those learnings and certainly thinking about how we expand the data that we collect um, and carefully thinking about sites so that we cover more of the US and bring broad representation to the trial. And I think um, you're hearing us talk about financing because it is, at the end of the day, kind of um, the foundation for uh, to be able to fund our work. We certainly want to include an open label extension, and this would be a very important part of a new trial if, if the financing permits it, to answer long-term safety questions, to really look at um, exposure um, over time, and then also to allow everyone in the trial to be treated. So. Those are things that we're looking into, and um, the next conversation. Um, you know, I, I think we've we've shared previously, but you know, we've really valued the conversations we've had ongoing with um, a you know a, a advisory board of neurologists and, and PhDs, and then also members of the the um, patient advocacy and um, and PALS community which um, really have helped our thinking. So we'll now move forward, have a discussion with FDA, and then, and then we'll be finalizing the design and moving as quickly as we, as we can. Thanks, Stacey. So I think I heard that you have not finalized sites yet, but there have been a variety of questions about that. So I just wanna ask explicitly and specifically questions around you know, what the potential sites are and then if there's going to be efforts to work with the FD, uh, I'm sorry, with the VA for 
um, more veteran accessible sites as well. Yeah, we will be giving a lot of thought to the sites have not been um, solidified and that will be an important next step for, for us, but um, we are absolutely looking to include um, a, a broad, a broad um, you know, really being strategic about geographic location and also access um, to, to different participants, in, including veterans. Thanks. And will you um, commit to L uh, OLE for study participants? And will that be part of your design? So it, it will be funding it, the, as we walk through. And uh, again, I um, want to really just compliment um, what Haim has brought time and time again, that's really allowed this product to, to proceed. Um, he has been successful and um, it certainly is a really critical part of a, of a company that doesn't have any other revenue. So um, what will be very critical um, when we, we think about the goal of this study, we need a successful trial. So the very first thing that we'll commit to is of course gonna be the double line portion that basically will um, accomplish what FDA requires and that will allow this to get approved. We do have um, you know, thoughts about what the open label would look like and then the funding will have to, to come through for it to be, to be a reality. Thanks, that makes sense. Um, assuming the trial goes well, the new phase 3B trial, when do you think the new BLA will be submitted? That was a previous question. Obviously now you were saying that's funding dependent, but I do think if you can share anything tangible in terms of what the timeline could look like um, once funding is procured and this is initiated, that would be helpful. Yeah, it's it's early to offer any kind of um, you know details in terms of timeline right now, and I think we'll continue to try to communicate um, in the best way that we can. Um, we are going to have immense urgency around this trial, and not only the trial, but also enabling a filing, um, you know, that could happen as readily as possible. So even thinking about the best case scenario, you know, being able to do an open label, it's very typical that you would have a double blind period lock. And you can imagine that we would be poised to file very rapidly. Um, but I, you know, again, I can't, I can't offer specific times, but it clearly will take, will take a number of years. And then, sorry, just a follow up to that, Steve. Thank you. Um, a variety of questions around if there's pos is there any potential to refile a BLA prior to the com completion of that trial if there's any additional data that's published? So, you know, after the outcome, we were quiet for, I think, only two weeks. And um, you can imagine, given our actions leading up to the outcome, we were trying to come up with anything that we could bring forward that might be able to accomplish, um, you know, a successful registration now. And we certainly contemplated a number of sources of data that we could bring to the forefront. We have an expanded access program that was ongoing when we filed. Um, and, you know, there is a lot of data that we're going to continue to try to bring learning to the scientific community and awareness about, about neuro. Um, but we, Firm, firmly believe and very sadly had to make the decision that um, really was in front of us, which is that the only regulatory path forward would be with evidence from this new trial. So we will certainly continue to be very engaged in the scientific community and we'll be bringing forward everything that we can that we're learning about neuro. Um, but we really don't see that this is, um, that it is possible to overcome the regulatory requirements that have been placed. Thank you, Stacey. And I think, you know, it's understandable that those details around the timeline wouldn't be available now, but please do um, continue to share as that emerges with this community because everybody will be waiting for that information. Um, a few questions that just came in, I'm gonna try to take some of these live questions. Um, first, can you discuss the threefold increase in mortality with neuron that was data that was um, highlighted at the adcom? Yeah, so we saw um, and spent a lot of time looking at the safety. You know, we spent a lot of time talking about efficacy, but um, our principal investigators, of course, the DSMB monitor this trial very, um, very carefully. Um, and um, you've heard um, our PIs actually talk about our safety data. So 
Overall, we had um, a smaller number of deaths than we anticipated in the trial, um, with the participants um, having more advanced ALS. Some, some of the trial participants, we saw that a couple didn't make it from the randomization actually to the first treatment. Um, and as we shared at the um, at the AdCom, you know, the, the numbers of, of deaths um, there were 10 deaths observed in participants randomized to neurone. There were six randomized to placebo. Two of those placebo did not receive a first treatment. So when you saw different numbers being reported, um, if we were talking about the overall safety database or the treated database, you'd hear 10 versus six versus 10 versus four. What's really critical is that none of the deaths, so safety that is reviewed on an ongoing basis, the investigators in the trial have to declare for adverse events of any nature, serious and certainly including deaths, if they're deemed based on their information, if they deem them related to product. At that point, they don't know if the, if the individual is on um, placebo or neuron. None of the deaths were judged in the opinion of the PI, both Brainstorm and also our medical monitor, who was a, a third party that was reviewing them um, as being related. And ultimately, you know, the, 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 the safety of our product requires a long, um, you know, a longer period of time and, and more, more patience. But um, from our PI's perspective, um, this is um, is is not a an imbalance um, that they have a concern over because of the details underlying it and the you know the knowledge of actually each case. So it's a matter of a small number um, that ended up being an imbalance um, that was not you mentioned threefold in your um, in your words. This was one of the components that would have been great to come out. Actually, the FDA's analysis didn't include all the deaths in the trial. Um, our analyses did. And so there were some numbers, again, that um, you had to understand why, why they were different. And um, we included all safety events that were reported by PIs. Um, the F FDA had a cutoff period um, where they did not include deaths after a certain time point or adverse events. And we, we did not believe that was appropriate, so. Thank you. Um, Kylan, I believe you referenced um, IRB approval or some modification in order for PIs to communicate with their participants around the treatment received. Can you share more about what the IRBs were requiring for the PIs to be able to move forward with communications? So I'm happy to to take that if, and then you can ask Stacy. So so each site has their own IRB and their own requirements. So I can just give you some examples. So like one IRB. Um, they have to call the participant or their loved one and say, do you want to know? And then if they say yes, they can tell them. If they say no, they say we can tell you at another date. All the IRBs have to have the form. If they send them something, it has to be approved. Um, and so it was working through that at each of the sites. And it, it will happen very quickly. We, we know that you deserve to know what treatment group you're in. And we know that this has been a prolonged period. And it, it will happen very quickly now that it's done and that we've worked through the IRB process. I don't know if you want to add anything, Stacey. I think that's sufficient. I mean, it, basically every site has to check in with the IRB. Some IRBs actually are closed. So they're having to go through the chair and get approval. But um, each of the PIs is very dedicated, responding quickly and getting the appropriate um, you know, review of materials and endorsements to proceed. And as soon as we have that, um, information again. I'll, I'll reiterate that this is we don't have individuals' names or information, identifiable information in our database, and so this only can go from a, a site to an individual or their or their their family family member, and um, and that will be happening quickly. Thank you. So not surprisingly, we are getting uh, follow-up questions around um, the next trial and the BLA. So um, questions about, and I know you mentioned already, you referenced outcome measures and being more holistic and thinking and measuring outcomes, but how in particular will the phase 3B trial uh, differ from the uh, first three trial? And 
you know, in particular, how large will it be and what is the timing? Not when will it start, but what will the timeline look like over the course of the trial? Um, so just some some basic information. Again, we'd love to come back and actually maybe once it's finalized, um, walk you know walk through um, you know the 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 design and and what will certainly be in in the public domain and share share the motivation behind them. But um, it is important that it's a controlled trial. Um, so it will be um, by regulatory terms a placebo controlled trial, but actually that's a bit of a misnomer because um, unlike the um, the phase three trial that's completed, um, we had one standard of care that was um, able to be used concomitantly. We'll actually allow all three approved medicines um, for sporadic ALS. Um, so um, across both arms. So um, individuals can come in and they can have the treatment as approved as they would be taking it if they weren't in the trial. Um, that control is very important for ultimately, you know, uh, making sure that if you have, we know ALS is a very heterogeneous disease and it's critical to be able to confidently conclude that um, the treatment effect, which we expect to see, um, is, is in fact due to the treatment and not something underlying or an imbalance. Um, we will be collecting a whole host of measures um, and certainly also uh, focusing on biomarkers. We probably will be um, very focused in our, in our plan, um, but those are a very critical part of understanding um, you know, our unique product and being able to see what is biologically happening to, to individuals. Um, we, we set a stretch goal in advance of the ADCOM and said we were hoping to start this in the first half of, of next year. And I think um, we'll have to see ultimately how quickly we can have alignment with FDA and, um, and, and of course, secure um, all of the steps required uh, to get it started. But there is great urgency on our behalf. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, am if you're still there, we are getting specific questions about how much funding you need. You're muted. I'm... Yes, sorry. Yes, I am here. Um, oh, it, of course, it will depend on how much, how many patients we will be treating in the next phase uh, 3B trial, and also to see if we can, how many patients we treat off-label how much patients will be treated in the double blinded and this is still a conversation so it's hard to know i can we can say what's well known that the phase three trial cost you know which one about... of them is how do i enter the trial because now i need Holly, to you're that. you're not muted about about 50 million dollars the, the phase three trial cost it um this is going to be a probably a longer trial and if we go from label even more expensive so it's gonna be a very expensive trial. There's no question about it. Uh, I I really hope that with fast alignment with the agency on a trial design, that will show that we're aligned. That it's true that the agency really just wants to see more data to prove what we were claiming that the data already shows. That's that's what they're telling us all the time that they don't disagree with our narrative. They just don't have enough for our narrative. They want to see more. The, seeing more means another trial, and. Let's see if we're able to pull it out. But thanks for those people asking us for the funding. I'm sure people are wanting to write the check. I wish I can write the check. I would have. I think the ALS community deserves that. I think cell therapy can really break the wall for many other neurodegenerative disease. As you well know, we had another open label trial in progressive MS, which had nice results. So it's an uphill battle when you bring something new for, for such diseases. And I'm so happy that our team is still willing to fight. It's, not, it's a long, tiring fight. Thanks so much, Chaim. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining today. And thank you again to Brainstorm for um, answering these questions. I do think there are some additional questions that will come in from the community. Um, and please feel free to continue to send questions to community at imals.org. And we can pass them along and post maybe just post a written Q&A on our website. And please do um, continue to share um, as things are evolving at Brainstorm. We can continue to do these or any other forum that makes sense. 
Um, and of course, you know, I know it's a value of yours, but we will very much like the ALS community to be involved in the design as early as possible. Um, with that, I'll pass it, Dan, to you to close out our meeting today. Um, um, this is a particularly tough thing, but every day in ALS is difficult. Um, the last two months have been extraordinarily tough for this community because it shows how broken the system is. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, it shows how amazing this community is um, and has grown um, in advocating for ourselves. I want to thank Ransom for accepting our invitation to share um, the information because this community deserves to understand both the challenges but as well as the path for uh, I want to close this by saying to all of everyone in the community, I am a risk for continuum to fight for you and we will continue to do our best to keep everyone informed of um uh, the latest development in uh, in this because um we have each, each other and we have to um really push together forward. Yeah, if I may add just a word, Andrea. Yeah, please. Yeah, if anyone is amazing, you're amazing. It's unbelievable to see patients like you, like Brian, being so selfless and giving so much time and energy. And as we remember, Sandy doing the same and so many others. This is a new thing happening in the last few years in ALS. I wish I am ALS would have a billion dollars. I think we'll be in a different situation here. It should be the case. There are so many people that are supporting ALS research. I am ALS is I think at the front running and advocacy now together with many other good new organizations over the last few years. But the funding is tough. Maybe NIH will help us grant. I don't know what. But I want to say you guys are really amazing. And Andrea, thank you so much for 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 making this call. Um, our hearts go out, as you, you can see, all of us. We, we're frustrated to be in this situation. I we would have wished to be in a situation where we have a treatment now to 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 offer to patients. But as as Dan was saying, we have each other, and we will give this another try. Thank thanks so much for for everything you. You have said for all your support and for all other advocacy groups that have been supporting us outstandingly and very vocally. And I also want to mention, you know, over 2,000 people wrote to the docket, and we should thank all of them. It's very abnormal to see such and so many doctors, including them, outstanding ALS doctors that really put out their neck there in, in such a environment. So th thanks to everyone. Really, thank you. Well said. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day.